first it was funny uh, that when I would introduce myself to people, they would ask what I was doing, you know, stuff like, it was like, oh, I, you know, build the man base and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, you build the man? That's cool. It's like, no, not the man, the man base. And then uh, they're like, what's the man base? It's like, well, it's that. You're an inker. That big old cool thing that the man is standing. You know, it's like all that <laughs> stuff that you're enjoying out yeah, there. The thing that makes the man yeah. actually interesting to go to. Yeah. And uh, they're like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and I was always like, damn, don't get no props for that. <laughs> and then, uh, and then when I was actually building the man, I was like, people would say, what are you doing? It's like, oh, well, you know, I build the man and stuff. And they're like, oh, that building is so cool. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, There's something wrong with my priorities here. I'm like, not. I'm doing this wrong, but that's a DPW mod. I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. I'm D-Day. I'm Rex. Welcome to Accuracy 3rd Season 5. Season 5, Episode 1, Beth. Yeah, so that's where what we're Beth doing. continues to refuse to identify herself. <clears throat> uh, nobody, nobody thought when we started this and nobody was listening to us that we would be doing this for five years. No, nobody thought that anything would happen. I don't think any of us had any expectations of this at all. I had delusions of grandeur. You really did. <laughs> and here we are now. <laughs> With a, a much improved studio and no parklet. Oh, uh, I think that's a cable, hold on. It's terrible. Yeah, that, that's working. Great. The uh, uh, cable from the PC to the monitor is like at capacity, so we really need to. Well, I mean, we need to we need table. to move the computer because it's uncomfortable there. But we also have the finances. Thank you, patrons, for buying a new longer cable. Both both things are true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Season five, episode one, take two. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if you've listened to the episodes. Almost every one is either up or down in sound quality. <laughs> we, we have consistently good editing. We don't have consistently good sound quality. We do have consistently good stories, and we have three consistent hosts, of which I am one. I am D-Day. Beth, throwing Beth. it to you. I'm Beth. That's Beth. I'm Rex. Great. And this is Accuracy 3rd. Accuracy 3rd, a podcast about Burning Man. And this is our fifth season about this podcast about Burning Man. And you would think, oh my God, how the fuck are you still talking about Burning Man? And the answer is frequently. We are still <laughs> frequently talking about Burning Man. And you are now invited to join us in listening to people frequently talk about Burning Man. Today we're going to be listening to Elo talk about Burning Man. And Elo is going to talk to us about building a man base, which is a thing that very few people are privileged to do. It's a small team of dedicated volunteers, and they work incredibly hard and have an incredible tight bond. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to know Slim, who was on Man Base Crew and who avid listeners have heard on this podcast last season in my personal life. And Slim helped me organize an interview with his Man Brace crew cohort. Uh, you just said Man Brace. Man Brace crew. Did I? Know? So Slim was kind enough to help me organize this Man Base crew interview session. And it took a while to get it all organized because we're all hippies and I'm not the best booker in the world. We're all amateurs at this. And by the time the interview session came around, everybody who had pledged to come had had to beg out except for Elo. So what you're hearing is Elo as representative of all of Man Base Crew, maybe? And if I remember correctly, <laughs> like because everybody begged out, we sent out an email saying, hey, guys, let's reschedule this for another time. And then like an hour and 15 minutes later, Elo showed up. <laughs> also, heads up, uh, all three of these dudes talk about 07 like everyone understands what happened to the man in 07 without ever referencing it ever directly. 07 is the year that Paul Addis set the man on fire early. 
and it, uh, yeah, you'll hear more about it. But when they start casually throwing that off, that's what they're referring to. Although they will bring it up like 30, 40 minutes later. That 2007 was a, a big year. Sure was. We had two burns. Two burns, Beth. Two. I highly recommend uh, looking up a bunch of images of the man bases that the guys end up talking about in case you haven't seen them because they're pretty impressive. Elo. Oh, that's a good face, Beth. <laughs> you got other things you want to talk about? I haven't listened to this audio for like oh. a year and a half. In 2005, I was out on the playa building the maze around the man. Mm -hmm. For Psyche? Yeah. And got involved with man crew and stuff. Just pitched in, started helping them, you know, put the thing together and Mm -hmm. be smart about stuff. Uh, Was the maze your project? Yeah. Yeah, I I was hired to make that happen. Um, you did an amazing job. That's one of my favorite man bases of all time. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Love that. The guillotine doors and the turnstiles mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've only seen pictures. I started going the year after that. Uh, yeah. That man, was... base, man base for hope and fear was, was pretty cool. Yeah. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't anything like as much fun though. I mean, it was neat. I liked it. And making the man go up and down was, was funny. We had, uh, we call the dope and beer club underneath, you know, because it was hope and fear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Um, underneath the man where the all the elevator mechanism was, we'd go inside there and stuff. Was, How did that work? work? There was a winch. Buddy Ben Stolting. Uh, Chainsaw? Yeah. He made a mechanism using a 3,000-pound winch cable and stuff and uh, had a fail-safe that was a, a water column. So like the huh. pipe going into another pipe that just, you know, it was a plunger. So it was right. a hydraulic resist. If the cable broke, you know, it was like ridiculously over-designed. But <laughs> he was very concerned about making sure it couldn't possibly fail. Well, the fail-safe is ridiculously over-designed. Like the actual mechanism itself seems much simpler than I would have expected. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it's just, yeah. A winch. It lifted the thing up. Pulled, you were, you were expecting some sort of like magnetic rail? No, I would have used the piston for raising and lowering it because I'm not a very good or efficient engineer or a trained <laughs> one even. Um, but that's how I would have solved that problem and probably used like cables and a winch as the reinforcement for the piston system, which I wouldn't be that sure would even work. Yeah, well, I guess if you have the, you know, if you use the piston to lift, then you have to have a pump, mm-hmm. and the pump has to operate at, you know, the right pressures, and you need all the pressure fittings, everything like that. That suddenly that becomes more dicey than mm-hmm. a very simple cable. Yeah. And so a three thousand pound winch was all it took, and um, three thousand pounds is, I mean the. The whole thing weighed much more than that, so it was just sure. geared. You know, it's just geared down. To, yeah, I was wondering about that. To do that, and uh, how much does the the man weigh? Ballpark. Uh, the wooden structure by itself is about a ton. Um, then it would have you know wax and neon and transformers and wire and all that stuff, cables and added on to it. So there's always an object of speculation. How much? How much is it going to weigh? <laughs> how much safety is in effect? Yeah. Well, we'd use the crane. You know, the crane has a scale on it. It's like, what's it weigh? And it's like, well, I don't know, somewhere between nothing and four thousand pounds. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know how accurate a crane scale is. <laughs> you know, it's got to be accurate enough so that the crane doesn't break. But other than that, I don't know. You, you know, know, within several dozen pounds i'd say it doesn't care yeah <laughs> yeah so i don't know we it was a a mocking tradition i don't know i never won so i never found out if there was a prize <laughs> <laughs> so you just you you just pitched in and they brought you on board yeah i <clears throat> was made an honorary member then and then next year i was up there building 
with them. And you've been doing it ever since? And I've done it ever since, yeah. Except R- for... Except for the... Uh, except for the disaster years. Uh-huh. The, um, the 60-foot man I did not participate <laughs> in, and the Da Vinci debacle I did not participate in. So, let's work backwards yeah. and talk about Da Vinci. <laughs> so... So from your recollection, what happened that year? I don't know. I was not involved, literally. In fact, I never even went out there. I was out at Burning Man that year for only like five days. I arrived the Saturday before the event opened. and The early man Saturday? Yeah. and No, no, not that Saturday. The, Saturday. the day before gate. And uh, saw that they were still working on it and everything like that and then they were still still working on it when i left on (laughs) wednesday night and much to my great amusement schadenfreude being what it is i was very amused to see the man upside down without a head and i was like this is yeah if the man doesn't that's what they get for firing me (laughs) (laughs) so um there's a bit of a story there, right? It wasn't just you that wasn't working on the man those couple of years. Um, it was a bit of a story. Um, it was sort of fixed up so that nobody, you know, by design or by accident or whatever, you know, pretty much nobody on the man crew, the former, the classic man, man crew classic, could uh, could go out to work on it when they decided they were going to just build it all on Playa. And because we built the man in June as the, the first project that would happen on the ranch. And I don't know whether that was a ceremonial thing at some point or just when it was convenient or whatever, but that's how it turned out was that it was always like the first project of the year. And we would go out there and we'd build the man and then we'd disassemble it and put it in a trailer and it would bake for a couple of months and then we would go back out and put it back together and wax it and wire it and put the neon on and put the cabling and everything like that together and then put it in place and then we were done until burn night so the initial construction gets done at the ranch uh does the the second assembly get done on site yeah, so it would be put into a semi-trailer and then dragged out to the playa and we'd unpack it and put it back together. I know Smoke Daddy preferred the method of having it built in June yeah. so he could get actual measurements yeah, he for liked... the flat pieces of glass that he was going to mount on there and he was pretty fucking pissed that there was this plan of building the man in place and him just like... Getting people to make glass that may or may not fit the man once the man is built. He didn't like the the level of finish on the Mega Man, mm-hmm. and but I mean it was so big that it's like, how much curvature is there going to be? I mean, is it really? So I don't know. But he did put neon on the head that year. I made the head for the Mega Man, mm-hmm. which the head itself was thirty five hundred pounds, which was you know Jesus. like a thousand pounds more than the man. <laughs> Usually wow. Was all the skinned man has got to be a heavy man. That's a lot of wood you're slapping on that. Oh, yeah, it was it was crazy. I mean, I didn't really have anything to do with it. That was sort of the, the year that we were all first sidelined as an entity. So what, what happened there? Can you tell us about that? Well, um, however it was decided, the... Uh, you notice I glossed over that part because I don't, I don't, I don't know. I could speculate, but I don't. Being short of facts, I don't have any idea. The, um, uh, I guess Larry decided to build a hundred foot man, and which I had thought was a good, a good idea since you know, two thousand six. It was like Larry, eighty foot man. You know, it's like, what are you doing? This is an arms race. We're just spending. <laughs> you know, more and more money on this uh you know in 2007 i i built i was in charge of the construction of the tent structures and then 2008 the american dream 
obelisk was my project and you know and that was you know nearing a quarter million dollars to build that thing and you know now that's chicken feed <laughs> it's a uh, and it's just like come on you know this what are, where are we going this is just you know let's just go back to building an 80-foot man and stand it on the playa mm -hmm. and then suddenly they did that but they decided that they were going to build it with the the base crew that it was going to be built by the carpenters instead of by the man crew and because it was too big a construction project for man crew which was certainly the case and mm -hmm. it's like just uh, in terms of uh how big man crew was it was like more work than you had hands? no it was more the you know i mean the the people tactical that aspects. were on man crew, you know, with some notable exceptions, weren't, you know, there weren't carpenters. A lot of them, you know, half of them, like, work for Burning Man in the office. So it's not, you know, or it seems like that. You know, they're not, they're not carpenters. They're not woodworkers. They're not even craftspeople. They're just, you know, they're, they're doing it because they get to and it's fun mm -hmm. um and to a certain extent this is a structure of a size that needs to be put together properly like a bridge or yeah a I lot mean, of people could get hurt yeah it had to be engineered and stuff mm -hmm. like that and uh so they decided they were going to do that and we had just been shunted out of the process completely and uh will roger and Larry allegedly found out about that and were really upset that we had been sidelined and f forced us back into the situation. And it ended up being that um, I and my crew would handle the head and the little uh, alcove. alcove chakra boxes, bird bird houses. Um, and that was it. So then, um, but because it was being done in August uh, on Playa, uh, there weren't uh, very many of the crew that could do that because, you know, taking a week off in June and then taking another week or week and a half stretching it in August, you know, there are people with kids and jobs and stuff they couldn't just disappear for a month and a half or two months like the rest of DPW um, and so it ended up just being a few of us that were out there building big giant head and it was cool I liked doing it and I actually kind of liked the the, the Mega Man I was I was in the minority I guess among the people that were uh, previously involved in it didn't like it but i i thought it was cool i like the scale of it i was not very pleased with how it burned oh well no that was that was down to you know that was somebody's fault because that, <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean i'm not even a pyro person but i know wood and wood doesn't burn that easily i no. mean it's a uh, you know, I saw those 72 foot long 20 by 20 glue lamps, and my first thought was, that's not gonna burn. <laughs> They're in fact yeah. made not to burn. <laughs> no, the, I mean, these were just laminated two by. Oh, not the ship's lamp. masts? They were, I mean, the glue itself is flame resistant or flame retardant, but it's. The lumber isn't treated to be flame retardant. It's it's not like uh, LVL lumber or right. you know the LSL. That's all the little sticks that are glued together that are actually fire retardant. Um, it's just that you can't burn wood. I mean, tree trunks don't burn. The, the branches burn off, but to burn the trunks, basically. They have to burn through at the bottom because of debris and then fall over and then they'll burn but you have to apply heat to them to make them burn and you can't apply enough heat to a 20 by 20 timber not that to make it burn straight up through right. uh -uh. in any reasonable amount of time i mean i read a story about a 
a uh, just how strong wood is that there was a, a warehouse fire in San Francisco some years back. A three-story wooden framed warehouse with a paint factory on the bottom floor. And the paint factory caught fire. The fire department came. They were there within four minutes. And the temperature inside was already 2,000 degrees. And they battled the flames for an hour and managed to put the thing out and the building never fell down and the 12 by 12 support posts that were holding the building up had burned down to four by fours <laughs> <laughs> and they were still mm -hmm. holding the building up because mm -hmm. a four by four is still really strong in compression it's not gonna it's not gonna fail and but that was a 2000 degree fire in an enclosed space for mm -hmm. an hour on a 12 by 12 and it was still a 4 by 4 so a 20 by 20 in an open space it's not going anywhere it's not going to burn yeah it's just obvious that you know and i don't know why that was ever allowed no know, i don't know it's why they called didn't... burning man not smoldering mm. stick right and um it's not healthy for burn perimeter to be on one knee for that fucking long. No. <laughs> it's not healthy for burn perimeter to be trying to hold a perimeter for that long. It is so stressful. If it weren't such a big structure that people knew like would kill everyone around <laughs> it if they went past the perimeter, I think that would have been a problem. But like nobody tried to breach perimeter. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, what I and anybody saw immediately when they looked at it before it was even built is that it's not gonna it's not gonna burn it's not gonna collapse it's just gonna fall over and it's a hundred feet tall so when it falls over it's gonna fall a hundred feet and 150 feet I think how far it fell or um how? when when you're trying to figure out a safe perimeter oh, yeah. around something well, that's I mean, falling, like because it can a, fall and then parts of it can break off and fall yeah. again half the distance. Yeah, it's uh, no doubt correct. But yeah, I don't know yeah. why they didn't plug it with like explosive dynamite bolts or dynamite <laughs> or something. Like, why didn't they they drill out holes in it and, and well, stuff them full of I accelerants? I suggested that they take the the huge bolts which were holding the hips together. Which, this was pretty cool. They were so big that they weren't actually bolts. They were tubes, Whoa. steel pipe mm -hmm. that was threaded on the ends. And they had huh. these monster nuts, like for building ships. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it was, I mean, it was a pretty neat structure in yeah. itself. I, I, I thought it was cool. And I thought we should just, we should pack those with dynamite or something like that. <laughs> and my, one of my friends on the pyro crew was like, uh, yeah, no. We can't. That's, <laughs> but we can we make the man put, a pipe bomb. We cannot put pipe bombs in the man. I mean, it's like that's <laughs> definitely going to result in. We you know, somebody anarchists. could lose an eye. <laughs> yeah. This used to be legitimately dangerous. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> How was 2007 for you? Oh, that was a drag. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Smoke uh, said. Yeah, so, okay. I had the worked, man. <laughs> I had worked on that tent structure, um, coordinating engineers and riggers and equipment operators and, you know, artists and suppliers and everything like that for, for like most of a year to get that thing ready to go that was really a, a crazy project um the engineer mark sinclair from he, he was a guy who worked at devon Kolb. i mean he was like you know world-class engineer devon, devon Kolb is a huge international engineering company builds mm -hmm. bridges and skyscrapers and stuff like that and he was all involved in burning man he described it as uh just like where else in the world would we be able to do something like this i mean this is basically building an upside down bridge on the playa where instead of holding something up we're holding something down but it's 300 feet long and you know one inch cables holding you know this it's just really a crazy thing we're doing and so it took a long time to figure out how we were going to do it because of course burning man is show business you know you've got 
we got two weeks to build the set. That's it. And so everything has to be prepped and ready to go. And you have to figure out the logistics of everything, how it's going to go together, how you're going to take it apart, where it's going to you know, be staged, what order you need, everything. It's a, it's a big thing. So making all of those decisions and trying to, you know, build it in your head and then refine and refine, redesign it. And that was a dumbass idea. Let's start over and, you know, go back and do it again. It took a lot of effort to get that to the point where we could actually do it. And, uh, we got out to the playa and started doing the the work and found out that the the water table on the playa was unusually high and we were putting these huge anchors into the ground and instead of getting you know our our the number of kips that we're supposed to get from the these ground anchors were 14 feet long and they, this huge blades on the end to to go in and get the the pullout resistance they went down seven feet and just started spinning because there was mud they just like went down and then there's no oh man there's no pullout so you know engineer had to redesign something on playa like we have to okay now we've got we're in the our two-week period and we're building and we don't have what we expect so what do we do everyone stop for math yeah (laughs) (laughs) uh and so we got it all built and you know made it and it was uh it was really neat i mean we liked doing it it was hard and it was interesting and it was a technical challenge and stuff and then uh i was out partying on that monday night with the lunar eclipse and everything and we'd been out uh whole crew of us had been out by the monkeys and just like totally tripping on that and how great it was and space cowboys were rocking it with the the unimog the unimog god and that just, fucking car it was the best thing ever i mean it was like just you know the perfect ecstatic burning man experience of just being out there and every five minutes when the the homo Barros would do its special magic mm-hmm. everybody around would just go yeah it was it was so much fun just that and it never got old i mean out there watching that happen for an hour during hour and a half the eclipse. or something during yeah the preparing for the eclipse actually it hadn't happened quite yet and so right about i don't remember when it was three o'clock or something we'd like sounds about right we'd gone back to camp and we're just gonna pull out some sleeping bags and sit on the sofas and look at the look at the moon and stuff and uh one of his radio comes on and it's like, Miss Dave X, the man's on fire. It's like, <laughs> it gets on the phone. <laughs> uh, that's not fucking funny. And you can't say that on the radio. It's like, uh, I'm not joking. The man's on fire. And I was just like, what? road i was camped in the in the circle around the center camp that year and ran out into rod's road and was like uh, oh fuck what <laughs> <laughs> and so i ran back and was like oh god what you know it's like i was drunk i'd been partying for hours you know it's mm-hmm. all danced out and you know, just it's ready to just sit on a couch and chill you know and Instead, I'm like running into my trailer and I'm like, oh, fuck, fuck, uh, car keys, fuck, laminates, fuck, radio, <laughs> fuck, like, where is all this shit? God damn it. You know, like, trying to get my shit together and I jump in my truck and turn the lights on and go racing out there and there's a big crowd of people around and everything like that and I 
pull up and I jump out of the truck and I go running up and this cop just like gets in my way, hands up, stop. It's like, oh shit, this is a cop. Like, okay, I gotta stop. <laughs> He's got guns, uh, maybe. They have guns. No, they <laughs> do. I it's was just like, okay, no, okay, all right, all right. Wait, but I'm like, I'm the boss. I got like, what? And he's like, you're not going in there. And it's like, I look, I've got plastic. <laughs> I'm, yeah. who don't you know who I am? <laughs> when did you get here? And he's like, no, he doesn't know. I mean, he doesn't care. And he's doing his job. So I'm, you know, it's like, anyway, so I'm just like, rump, rump, rump. And then, uh, you know, a couple minutes later, I see like heavy equipment crews come walking out and the, you know, the fire's been put out by the, the fire trucks coming and spraying it out. and that uh, turned into a very long night and I remember sitting there after having gone in and gone up and looked at the man and looked at the structure and you know on a boom lift and like checked it all out it's like what's you know what's going on and walked around and sitting down with uh, with Rosie Crimson Rose from the it was her her deal back then and she was art department lead and the man and the man base were part of art department, not DBW. So I was sitting down with her and she's like, what, what are we going to do? What should we do? It's like, well, we got two choices. We can leave it up there and go on with Burning Man as this thing is burned or we pull it down and make another one. And it's like, it must have been before that because actually at 6.30 that morning, there was already a truck on the way to Reno to buy materials to rebuild the man. So either either my my memory is vague or it had already been decided or somebody jumped the you know gun and <laughs> decided that they were just going to be ready for that or whatever, but within a matter of hours that tent one of the side tents had been cleared out um, in part of its exhibits and you know the table saw had been brought down from the ranch and all kinds of equipment and DPW pulled out the stops and fenced off the whole area and, you know the fencing crew was up and uh, you know it was just like everything you know hit the ground running and uh, we were back to building a man again. Did you have to build it completely at a, uh, from scratch? Yeah. Wow. It was like, do we rebuild that one or do we make a new one? And, you know, I, my take on it was, no, we're not, you know, that's, uh, we just, uh, we're just going to make a new one. Because it's like, it. for one thing, I mean, there was a lot of things. One is, hey, wait, it's ours. You know, you, you can't you can't burn that. It doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we make it, it's our project and we're doing it on behalf of everybody that comes to Burning Man. You know, it's not, you know, we're just proxies for everybody else. It's not a, you know, it's not a personal project. We don't fund it. We don't think of it. We just do it and we're privileged proxies to do it for everybody else. And so one person doesn't get to decide to burn it down and also it wasn't structurally sound anymore we couldn't be sure that it would hold itself up you know strong wind we don't want it to fall we can't let people walk around underneath it if it might fall down and all of the so, exhibits were underneath it well they weren't strictly underneath the man that whole space was underneath the man and so yeah it was taken down and put on a flatbed and driven out to the to the depot and left there and um does it remain there to this day oh no i cut it up with a chainsaw and <laughs> it went into the, the stack of wood around the so it was part of the pyre oh that, nice nice that built the that burned the new man which didn't burn very well you might have remembered because it was all wet i mean it was made of brand new Fresh construction new wood, yeah. lumber which is all still full of water so when i said earlier that we load them loaded the man up in a trailer and left it for a couple of months it was super duper dry tender mm -hmm. dry and would go up and without very much encouragement <laughs> yeah just wax and burlap 
uh, well, wax and burlap and a whole bunch of wood is a big ass candle. So yeah, I mean, once you let the wax on fire, it's going to burn, and it did. It went up really fast. You know, the the fact was that it, it that's what it's supposed to do. Um, is that part of the thinking in building it in June? Is to give it time to bake out? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Lumber dries really fast out there. So if we built it at the beginning of August, I'm sure it would be dry enough too. But building it, you know, two days, three days before the burn, it's not dry and it didn't burn well. But it was very symbolic. Yeah, I mean, it was 56 hours from when it burned to when it was standing back up on the uh, the support for it, which was... A huge iron beam supported 40 feet above the playa. And, uh, um, yeah, that was such an interesting man base that year. The man just like on a stick in space with the pyramid of lumber beneath it. Yeah. And that big tent. I mean, the yeah. tent was lovely. I was, oh, yeah. And that, you know, that was kind of heartbreaking because when you think about it this way, there was probably a couple thousand people who had worked on the structure, the exhibits, the ideas, getting all of that stuff together to bring it out there and set it up for a five-day event. And then, you know, one person shuts it down for three days out of that five days. And, you know, the tent was all burned up and ugly and stuff. It was just like, you know, you learn and kindergarten that you don't knock the other kids blocks down you know it's like if you want to knock something down make it yourself and you know i probably would have just been all for it if somebody had you know thumbed their nose at the org and said i'm going to light my structure on fire on monday instead of waiting till thursday or friday whatever it's like this is burning man i'm doing it it's like yay you know fight the power whatever but when it's your structure yeah it's your structure you don't burn somebody else's structure down so in those 56 hours I got like 7 hours of sleep <laughs> and I, I probably made a half a dozen decisions all told as the the project manager and did some of the cutting and stuff like that but mostly it was just you know being there um, one of the crew Otto said uh, this is the best thing I never want to do again (laughs) (laughs) yeah that was a it was a a unique experience and it was in a lot of ways a great experience but it was also a fantastically disappointing and heartbreaking experience because people didn't get to enjoy that unique space which hasn't been duplicated it again i mean it's like lots of people have nice big canopies but that canopy was 300 feet long 90 feet wide and 40 feet high and had a dappled light in it that was totally cool and you know a lot of people myself included spent a lot of time on it and we didn't get to enjoy it we ended up enjoying something else but you know that's just making lemonade (laughs) (laughs) the Uh, man that you uh that you guys built to replace the burned man was it the same size yeah it was the same except that the it was rougher because we didn't have the the uh you know the time it was i mean we built it in 56 hours with a whole bunch of people and volunteers and People from Temple came, and people from Man Crew came, and people from DPW came, and stuff like that. A lot of people came and wanted to help out and get it back on track. Um, but it was, you know, it's the same structure, waxed it up the same, even though there's the... Okay, so here's the maybe the most incredible part of this whole story. You mentioned smoke earlier. So all the neon was busted up on the man. And so they decided they were going to make a new suit of neon for the man. And so Smoke and another glass blower named Dr. Glass Eye went down to Reno to find a neon shop where they could blow glass. And they found a place, I guess it's probably kind of a small community of neon glass blowers in 
the U.S. and how many <laughs> there, they probably knew each other anyway. So finding Neon was not the amazing thing. They went into this place, and it turned out that the guy had the same exact, extremely rare, unusual, special kind of glass that was needed to make that particular color of neon for the man, except that it had a phosphor on the inside of the tubes. And the tubes and the phosphor, the tubes are fine, but the phosphor had been ruined in a flood in Reno, and the guy had kept that glass for 15 years wow. with a ruined phosphor inside of it just because, and it turned out that that was the exact glass that was needed in order to re-blow a duplicate set of the exact same color. So the man was burned, and you know, three days later, it was back up essentially identical to what it was before except that the head of the man, one of the faces had a phoenix on it that was carved by this guy, Goat, who is now working with me on building the uh, man base for the current year. <laughs> Great guy. Yeah, it was. Uh, he was out at Temple, I think, that year or something. I'm hoping that it was him because that's what I remember. But anyways, <laughs> if, it wasn't, if it wasn't him, sorry, Goat. Uh, and sorry to whoever it was that actually did it, but there was uh, made this uh, this really great phoenix and got a piece of green glass from one of the melted pieces of glass um, uh, off the playa to make the eye for the phoenix, and it's really cool. We put it up there, and then at the burn, when the man fell because it didn't really burn all the way it collapsed and hit the ground and the head broke off unburned and fell out of the fire and some people ran out of the crowd and uh um started like dragging the head, the away. head away and i was of course inside the burn perimeter <laughs> And I just shouted, no! <laughs> I started running across the the uh, the burn, and uh, they all just scattered. And uh, somebody came out of the crowd to help me, and I threw it back on the fire. <laughs> um, and later, I I saw this. A uh, post that somebody had made about it that said, Yeah, and then some huge DPW guy in a black hoodie and a kilt came <laughs> running across the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that was, yeah, that was a year. That was something. I have, I have some unique pictures from that year. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see them. Yeah. yeah. So out of the projects you've worked on out there, do you have a particular favorite? Yeah, I have some favorites. I would, you know, I love all my children. <laughs> um, I think uh, the American Dream was a really pleasing technical challenge. A lot of people really put a great amount of effort into that, myself included. I was the project manager lead for that. That was... A favorite of mine because of the burn it was one of my favorite burns because it was all built out of the uh, engineered lumber so you know people were saying it's not gonna burn it's not gonna burn and I was a little worried myself that it wasn't gonna burn that but, was the one that was uh, essentially a just a, t a tall tower right? yeah it was yeah. a 64 foot tall obelisk and it was only 16 feet square at the base, so mm -hmm. it was very, very high. And um, three stories of 16 feet each. <laughs> so there was the platform at the top was 40 feet, 48 feet above the playa and had a, you know, a fantastic view. And then the man was on top of that. And um, so I had, I had, 
spearheaded that whole thing to get that built. And one of the decisions that I made on that project was to insist on internal guying for the structure. So there were no cables outside. That whole thing was internally guided. Yeah. Wow. So, um, because Larry Harvey and Rod Garrett, who is the architect designer of many things you still see at Burning Man died in 2011. They just said, no, just do external guy. And I was like, no, 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 it's inelegant. And people are just going to get clotheslined. I don't, I don't want to do it. We're going to, we're going to go with internal guying. So that ended up costing quite a lot of money because the huge knuckles that were at the junctions between the, uh, the floors and the four columns that were holding the thing up, those were all welded plate steel. And each one of them was specific to specific location and stuff like that. And the estimate for how much those were going to cost was grossly under the actual <laughs> cost. <laughs> and I didn't know any better. And that was a, that was a big failure taking somebody else's word for what that was going to cost. Um, you got to point out to the org that they saved a lot of money on pennant flags that you didn't have to run down external cables. So folks yeah. didn't clothesline themselves on them. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a cost savings right there. Yeah. That must have been at least 40 grand in pennant flags mm -hmm. we didn't buy. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, so the internal guying was really elegant and meant that that whole thing was just standing up totally rigid and it didn't move at all. It was really a wonderful structure. And what it meant was that when it burned, the whole thing fell at once in a way that it has never done before or since. It collapsed straight down from a hundred feet tall into like a 20 foot puddle of fire. And I thought that that was a triumph and I was very proud of myself. And the next year I was fired. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's what you get for success. Yeah. And then in a kind of a, a backhanded promotion, I was hired to build the man specifically instead of the man base from that point so that, that's a, a minimum lateral <laughs> yeah so it was like uh less pay less responsibility uh less challenge but a More higher prestige. sort of yeah higher sort of ceremonial prestige and stuff like that but you know it's sort of funny first it was funny uh that when i would introduce myself to people and they would ask what I was doing, you know, stuff like that. I was like, oh, I, you know, build the man base and stuff like that. And like, oh, you build the man? That's cool. It's like, no, not the man, the man base. And then uh, they were like, what's the man base? It's like, well, it's that. You're an inker. That big old cool thing that the man is standing. You know, it's like all that <laughs> stuff that you're enjoying out yeah, there. The thing that makes the man yeah. actually interesting to go to. Yeah. And uh, they're like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and I was always like, damn, you don't get no props for that. And then, uh, and then when I was actually building the man, I was like, people would say, what are you doing? I was like, oh, well, you know, I build the man and stuff. And they're like, oh, that building is so cool. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, there's something wrong with my priorities, but I'm like, not... I'm doing this wrong, but that's a DPW monitor doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so this last year, if you saw the man, I assume you saw the man in his, in his temple, you saw a lot of what I brought to making the man, which was all of the little details, like every single piece of the man is finished to a degree. Not that it has a finish on it, but it has been You do finish touched. carpentry to it. It has been, you know, the edges have been dressed and things have been sanded and, you know, the construction stamps have been t sanded off and, you know, it is done with care. And that's because I think because we have, you know, 
when I was involved in it because we have this privileged position to build this thing and um, have bragging rights if you want to use them of that sort of thing. Um, you you have a responsibility to all of the you know 70,000 people that come to the event who don't get to build it you're building it on their behalf and you're just making it how you do it is up to you to decide and I think having that attitude that you're making it on behalf of all of these other people is a way to invest the effigy with the kind of psychic energy that you want it to have if you think that sort of stuff matters and I think it matters to put the effort into things to make them beautiful and make them worthy of the effort that you put in. That was another thing that I really wanted to do with the man crew was make it so that the amount of effort they put into it was honored by the result that they got. Mm -hmm. So there was a, there was a lot of you know a lot of really dedicated uh, engineering and. Uh, thoughtful problem solving about how to make that structure work. Now, the, the guy who was in charge of it, Nathan Altman, Mary Poppins, I met him first uh, a couple of years before that building the Temple of Promise, which I, I worked on. And I got involved in that early and managed to have a salubrious effect, if salubrious is the right word for something that you're going to burn down. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, the health of the fire. Getting the idea through to everybody that the arches needed to be hollow, that the whole thing had to be a box beam or it wouldn't burn. And just using the example of everything that people try to build out there with big timbers, you cannot build something with solid timbers and have it burn in a big open space. You have to have an applied heat to make wood continue burning. So you made so the entire column a chimney. Each, yeah, every one of those arches was a chimney. <clears throat> and it's like, then we could build it out of, you know, glue lambs and it would burn. If it's a chimney, it's going to burn from the inside because you'll have this hot blast of funnel of air going through it and drill holes in the sides. It's and the go. gaps between all of the individual temp I saw that and I was just like, oh my God, like, like you guys really thought about how this is going to go up and how it's going to have to go up. Yeah, and so Nathan... He really took all of that to heart, and he really, he really got it, and took it way further than than I was able to. You know, last year he was in charge of building not only the the structure but the man as well. So the whole thing became one project, and he and Kimba Kim Jorgensen they really went back to trying to have it be the kind of cool collaborative process that it was before it got all messed up. Get it back to being done in a craftsman-like way and as an art project and with people getting to, to learn things and invest the whole project with their artistic energy in a way that had not been going for a couple of years or not. You know, I'm sure that there are plenty of worthy people that are working on the structures that didn't work out that well, but they didn't have the right ethic in forming the whole process. So it was not a great result in terms of people's experience and in terms of the actual results. There's a lot of disappointment and negativity and things not working right. But Nathan figured out with the engineers how to make sure that the thing was going to burn because that's the whole point is that it's a, a structure for burning. It's not a structure that's going to stand for 50 years or 100 years or whatever. It's not, you can't simply engineer it to hold up. That's not the point. <laughs> and, you know, by, you know, he got that and ran with it and, um, I mean, I say he got that. Maybe he had it already, and I'm giving myself way more importance than I deserve. <laughs> but um, I know we talked about it, and he did that, and he might have done that anyway. But I take a tiny bit of credit for it, maybe. <laughs> the thing is that he he got that 
those whole huge columns designed in such a way that they were full of air instead of just having 20 by 20 glue lamps hold the whole structure up. It's like they made mechanically laminated things that were just held together with bolts and steel plates and stuff so that when it fell, it, it just fell apart. It just fell apart. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's how you, that's how, you know, I'm trying to do it now. How we're trying to figure it out now is how to build things so that, you know, these high elevated structures that are full of air will burn and fall apart, not burn and leave some steel structure standing that then is just, you know, some big thing that has to be disposed of. <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you do with it? You know, the, uh, the giant, the top of the American Dream Tower was, uh, you know, this pyramid of, uh, tube steel mm -hmm. and that thing fell you know 60 feet with into the fire with the man falling down on top of it and it was totally undamaged <laughs> and it sat on the ranch for years i don't know what happened to it whether it's still there or what somebody repurposed it i don't know they should have made that into their board table yeah. yeah i mean it was pretty cool it was eight feet tall and 12 feet square and it was a pyramid so <laughs> I was uh, really eager to see the the peak on the top of the pagoda drop down this year. Uh, that was such a cool bit of metalwork, and then it fell with everything else, and it <laughs> couldn't see it at all. Yeah, well, somebody got that out of the fire. You know, it's like really I, nice. Yeah, I mean, people we referred to the bits of the man. Uh, that were left over as the hippie swag that, that, <laughs> or swag if, if you prefer. And actually I prefer, I don't know when I started saying swag instead. Um, like in 2009 or 10, we started making these shoulder pivots for the man that were, they're made out of steel welded together by a guy on the crew, Sparky, quite a good welder. And, Everything works at the DMV. Mark Simonoff is his name. And he uh, started making all the, the metal parts for the man. And we started figuring out new and different things that we could add to the man that made parts of our work more reliable and or maybe easier or whatever. But that would also leave something behind for people to find, which... Uh, is fun. I mean, it's like, I remember telling somebody in the, uh, at the burn of the, uh, the spaceship, um, that, oh yeah, if you, if you walk around, just, if you find a cable, start pulling on it. There's something cool at the end of the cable. <laughs> right. And, uh, it turned out actually that year that all of the cables were attached to each other. <laughs> like so someone there was, just was pulling like, a, a rat's nest of cable. Yeah, but they pulled somebody pulled the meteorite out of the oh cool out of the fire, and of course the meteorite was totally undamaged by the fire, and uh, yeah, so they ended up with that lump of space rock. That's great. And yeah, I sort of wish that I had ended up with it because it was pretty. <laughs> and I that same year, I guess. Was it the same? Yeah, it must have been that same year. We had a uh, the heart of the man. There's always a heart to the man, which we made. Man crew would just make that. And usually it was done, traditionally done, by a newbie on the crew. Um, is it the same kind of thing every year? Or is no, it, it, was, it was a unique thing every year. And it was usually just left up to somebody to do it. It's like, so here's the thing. We make a heart for the man. We put it in the position where the heart is and we all sign it and the man base crew signs it and it goes up in there and nobody knows it's there except us. And then it gets burned up or whatever. And, but that year, uh, we made the heart of the man was a steel plate that had everybody's name welded onto it with cool uh you know mig mm -hmm. mig lines and um so that was a, a really cool thing <laughs> and the uh the 
gal that took that on, Meredith Chef, Meredith Chef King, actually got it back out of the fire, and it's in the DPW saloon in Gerlach with all everybody's names welded onto it, and that's pretty... <laughs> That was unique that year. Yeah, that's fabulous. Do you have a, a man artifact? I do. I have one of the knuckles in my front yard from the the American Dream uh, that I went I went out the day after that fire and pulled one of those things out of the fire. I mean, weighed like two hundred pounds, and <laughs> I threw it into the back of my truck and drove it home. And it's now in my front yard, and it's neat because. It looks, it's like a, I mean, it looks like somebody made it as a piece of art because it's all twisted, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, oh, half, it's corporate art. It's half inch, <laughs> it's half inch plate. And, you know, it's about two and a half feet tall and it weighs 200 pounds. You know, it's like, uh, uh, it's neat. And, uh, other artifacts do I have? Isn't that eyebolt from the man? Yes. Uh -huh. Great. Who did we get that from? I think I got that, didn't I? From who? From the man out of the fire. You went there to Burning Man, like L lots of times. Right, but to the man after it was burnt to get a piece of hippie swag from. It. Yeah, I do that sometimes. Huh. I've got like nails and stuff. Yeah, but see, something like that, you could get that by pulling on a cable because mm -hmm. that's attached to a cable. If you pull on the cable, there's something attached to it. Right, and you know when. When I was in charge of it, I always wanted to make sure that there was something cool. So, you know, Sparky liked uh, making things out of metal, and he would take a lot of care with making them. You know, the welds were all really nice, and, uh, you know, edges were polished and burnished, and he would put a little mark on them and stuff like, you know. But like I was saying earlier, the best piece of swag from the man that I have is the green borosilicate glass loop that... Uh, smoke made out of the green man glass from the burn, from the uh, first from the, burn yeah the from premature the burn premature burn man um, that's a treasure right there yeah that's uh it's way more valuable than it than the jade people think it is <laughs> 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 would be even if it were you know a really beautiful piece of jade like that that was that i mean i suppose that might actually be a pretty valuable piece of jade if it was that piece of jade but there's still a lot of but jade it's, it's still way cooler than even a cool piece of jade because it's totally unique i mean each one of them is unique and there were only i don't know maybe he made 50 of them or something he's only just started making them out of like the new discarded pieces of glass that he doesn't have enough left over from to make like a big piece of neon art out of yeah yeah, so those, uh -huh. those first green ones are... Dude, I don't fucking have one of them. <laughs> You're not getting one before I do. I've paid my smoke daddy dues. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to pay dues to be with smoke daddy. I guess just being with him is the, uh, is the payment. Every once in a while, uh, his living situation implodes in one way or another, and then like he might be in the front room for the next couple days or the next couple months. But we provide that service to smoke daddy because he has provided so much to us. Yeah, you know, an awesome dude gets like a, gets yeah. a couch if he needs it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he comes. He re the nice thing about it is whenever he shows up, I know he's going to be here for a while, and I know he's going to help me on house projects. And I also know there's like a 70-plus percent chance of our plumbing imploding while he's here through no fault of his own but he is a licensed plumber so he's been able to help like is he's been right? here and like the entire <laughs> tub above our heads has started leaking our fucking hot water heater like was just sluicing water out of it when he just happened to be at the house just like oh my god oh my god you're here that's great uh did you ever the think that your water heater is doing your, something i have never seen it do before <laughs> you know it might be him maybe your house is allergic to him and it's mm -hmm. just like the smoke daddy dander is causing or he knows we're gonna let him stay for a while if he both breaks and then fixes our hot water <laughs> well great wonderful that was elo <laughs> <laughs> we 
certainly learned a lot about the man base and man build crews. Uh, That's Beth's thesis for the episode. Yeah. Thanks for editing a great episode, Beth. Thank you for giving me that audio to edit. Um, Hey, stay tuned for the rest of season five. They will be showing up every two weeks unless I can't hack keeping up with the editing, but uh, we'll do our damnedest. If you have the urge to talk about Burning Man all the time, even with people who don't know anything about Burning Man, because you or someone you know has mentioned your podcast that you're working on about Burning Man, I mean, that's a plus. If you already can't shut the fuck up about Burning Man, join our team. Great, thanks. (laughs) Sweet deal. I think we're done with this. Beth forgot how to outro. (laughs) Oh, God. Do we even need to say this shit anymore? Yeah. Accuracy Third is produced by Accuracy Third. Uh, Share our podcasts if you want, and it would be awesome if you left us a review. And and subscribe, because then you'll know when the podcast comes out literally seconds after I upload it. Recommend us to your campmates. Torture your friends with our voice (laughs) during group projects. Uh, And torture us with attention on social media. It makes us feel really uncomfortable. (laughs) Yeah, we enjoy it. Please do those things. And share your stories with us. Drop us an email at accuracythird at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at accuracythird. Uh, Facebook too, although, you know, fuck that shit. Facebook. Ugh. Ugh. Quit it today. And if you want some Accuracy Third merchandise, feel free to visit our store on the online. It is burnernark.com, a perfect place to get clothes that will make you look like a narc at Burning Man. Season five! <laughs> Bad. Yeah. Rex, we're doing it. Yeah, and Kim Jong Elo came about as an accident because my name is Elo, I L O. And one morning at the man build, uh, my funny and clever friend, Matthew Ebert, better known as Metric, uh, came by. Or actually, I walked by him with a cup of coffee in the morning after a night of heroic whiskey drinking. And he said, Good morning, dear leader. And I snorted coffee off my nose and said, Yeah, right, Kim Jong Elo. And it stuck. And so. It's a good one. Yeah. I mean, decreasingly relevant as he decays. But it just, like, (laughs) I mean, it just happened. It wasn't anybody thinking. And so, dear leader became. Those are the best play names. Yeah. Yeah. And. uh,